very sick and dying and can no longer really receive the uh, Eucharist. And they call a priest and you anoint the person. We're not that cleanse his sin and gives him a little, some kind of assurance that he's going to be, he's going to see God, he's going to be in heaven. Yeah, so when, you know, when I, I don't know what other priests do, I just know what I do for myself. When I am called to the hospital, um, I usually assess to see, I'm not a doctor, I don't know how all this stuff works, but if you see the person there, it's like clearly it's the end, then I'm not just going to do the anointing and the oils, I'm going to do the whole series of prayers. And you know, the church bends over backwards for a soul who's passing from this life. The church, you know, bursts open the treasury, opens the treasure chest of everything that she has to give to this, to this person who's dying. Um, on January 6th, um, very early in the morning, my grandmother passed away. Um, so just a few weeks ago, I did her funeral last week. Um, but the, uh, when I was there, you know, my, she was semi-conscious. And, um, you know, I was holding her hand and I said, you know, this is your cross right now. You don't have to be afraid. Our Lord is with you. This is the place that you are meant to be. You're right. You're united to Jesus right now, Grandma. And then I said, if you squeeze my hand just a bit, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? And she, you know, ever so lightly, you know, squeeze. And she couldn't talk or anything. And um, then I, uh, what I did was I read the scripture to her. And I said, Grandma, I know you can't talk to me right now, but confess your sins in your heart. You know, tell Jesus what you're sorry for. You know, because she could, t you, you know, again, this is a spiritual thing, so you could talk to God. And I said, I'm going to give you the absolution. So I gave her the absolution. Then I gave her what's called the apostolic pardon, which is the, um, basically releases you from purgatory. So all the punishments of this life and in the life to come. And then I couldn't give her communion because I didn't have the host because I didn't realize that she was that great. Um, but I asked her to reprofess her faith. And then it was clear she was dying, so we went through the litany of saints because you need, you know, your friends in high places to come to your aid at the moment of agony. And then I did said a prayer of commendation, go forth Christian soul from this life to the God who created you, go forth a faithful Christian. May you be with God this day all the saints in paradise. And that's it. Yeah. And, and then on the other side of it, sometimes I'm being called upon to, if they cannot find a priest, that I can go over to a dying person. And, um, you know, I, I do all the prayers that I can, and I ask the person to, if there's anything that is bothering that person, mm -hmm. like uh, sin or anything, to confess it to God, I cannot absolve but I can still give a blessing. And then, a certain point to free herself and make a confession in the heart, maybe a perfect contrition of sort, and then exactly. let the person go, go forth, go forth so. Yeah, you know, I, there, I heard this from one priest. They said, you know, when you have someone who's dying, they're not gonna go unless you tell them it's okay. And in a way, that's sort of like what the anointing or when we give, do pastoral care, or you know when we have all of us are going to have to say goodbye to someone that we love and that is very hard which is all the more reason why we should be receiving the sacraments in the eucharist yeah <clears throat> but when we have a loved one sometimes it's we want to hold them so tight you know but sometimes we say it's okay you could go because jesus is waiting for you and my faith is that i know that i'm going to see you again maybe not in this life but if Jesus is right, then the life to come. So having that sense of hope is necessary to accompany our faith. Remember, we need faith and we need hope. So, um, yeah, preparing someone for death is very hard, but also a very beautiful thing as well. Any other question? Any other question with you, Chris, or anything in general that you've been burning to ask me? <laughs> we are both big. Big. Big one, big two, okay. I'm the one at the back. 
I learned that one way of having Jesus' presence among his uh, followers on earth is through the mystical body. By mis mystical body. Okay. Uh, by mystical body, we mean the church. The church. Those <coughs> who have been, uh, who have been uh, reborn through baptism, and are now li living as the li uh, living as the members of Christ's body on earth. Uh, this uh, mystical body is also. The, uh, uh, is also the place where the Holy Spirit uh, gives the members of the congregation the, the graces that he carries. And so the members of the congregation will also absorb the graces and share these graces to those who have not gone to the congregation or the mass, yeah. but those who have can share those blessings with them, and it's easier for the, the people who are scared to preach. To Which is everybody, yeah. I don't <laughs> <think it's scary. laughs> so yeah. I think the members of the congregation has that privilege so those to share those. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's the goal. And that's the goal of evangelization or mission. You know, what is the what does the word mass mean? It means to be sent, right? Well, mass or misa it has the same root as mission. So that when the priest says, you know, go in peace glorifying the Lord by your life or go Fourth, the mass is ended. That's basically saying the priest saying, "Get out of here! Go, go do something! You know, go, 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 go! Take what you've learned here and and, and spread it. It it starts. It takes you. You've come to the church to be nourished, to be fed, but now you should leave joyful and say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna win one soul for Jesus this week." You know. So yes, you're right. And you know. Yes. It, the body of Christ, too, though, we're all members of Christ's body, right? Mm -hmm. And the head of the body is Jesus Christ himself, okay? Yeah. But when one member of the body <coughs> suffers, the whole body suffers with it, you see? And so we're going to feel each other's pain. You know, I'll tell you a perfect example. In Union City, the neighbor of Fremont, they have one Catholic school there, Our Lady of the Rosary. Um, they're closing Our Lady of the Rosary School at the end of the school year. Very, very sad. Same with St. Martin de Porres, St. Jarlet, St. Jerome in El Cerrito. And, uh, and St. Lawrence of Tool. Yeah. So, so, so those are schools that are being closed. And we, uh, my principal, the principal of my school, went over to Our Lady of the Rosary for the announcement very much lots of anger, lots of sadness, a lot of despair. And then the, today, we had about seven families coming to us saying, we want to go to your school now because we don't have a school left. And I'd love to have them. I don't know how we're gonna make this work out, but so pray for that, pray for us, pray for those families. But do you see what I mean? Like my heart, our hearts go out to them. We wanna help them, you know, because their school is closed, not because of what they did, but because we messed up, you know? It's not, they're not there, it's not their fault. But how do we then show mercy to them? To bring them in, you know? So, yes, you're absolutely right. The body has, the, 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 the members of Christ's body, all of you, the lay people, have a big role. Yeah. The pro Protestant has a different way of offering their uh, Eucharist to the parishioners. Yes. So that they have a big bread, Yes. Small uh, bread like a crackers and a small uh, <laughs> wine tray and the yes, yes, plastic. Yes. Compared to the Catholic, who is very artistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Catholic way. Catholic yes, yes, yes. Like yes. to pray. Now, my, my question is, which one is more uh, 
presence of the Lord in that. Very good question. Thank you for that. Um, do Protestants have the Eucharist? The short answer is no. Because the Eucharist can only be celebrated by a validly ordained priest in communion with the whole Catholic Church. So we're Roman Catholic, yes? But if you go to a Maronite Catholic Church, is there a Eucharist, real Eucharist? Yes. They do things a little differently than we do, but it's they're in communion with us, meaning we share the same profession of faith. So looking at, we, have, we don't have much contact with Eastern rites, maybe some of you might, but majority of us are contact with, or with the Orthodox, yeah, not many of us would have the uh, contact with them. I mean, some will have a relationship, but I think many of us here in the U.S. or here in mainstream America, if you will, our contact as Catholics are going to be with, what, Protestants, right? Mm -hmm. And with the Protestants, they don't have a sacramental system. You know, they don't have the sacraments at all, except for baptism and marriage. That's about it. And depending on which Protestant form of Protestant group that you go to, they might have this or that, or they might have confirmation. Some might have Eucharist. Down the street from our church, there's Centerville Presbyterian. They do Euchar Eucharist. They, I forgot what they got. They, they, they do it once in a while. But it's more of, it's not Jesus Christ truly body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's, see, we're all sharing. Sharing is caring. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a, it, it's a symbol. Yes, exactly. And, yes, and our Lord was not talking about a symbol. By the way, would you believe in a symbol? Would you stake your life? Would you die for a symbol? Probably not. But you want the real thing. I'll die for the real thing. Okay, they turned the thing on. That's probably made their thing. No, Father, go away now. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes last, oh, last question. Oh, you're the last question. Oh, so, there, over there, and then, oh, yes, 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 ma'am. out of it is depending on where your heart's at. You know, um, these days you have uh, the normative way to receive Holy Communion in the diocese and in the United States is to receive Holy Communion standing in your hand or on your tongue. Some places they kneal. Our Lady of Peace. Our Lady of Peace they do, yeah, yeah. Some priests, they get very upset when the people kneel to receive. For me, if they kneel, I'm not going to make a big deal of that because that's their, where their heart is. Because you could have reverence by doing this, you could have reverence by doing this, or you could have reverence by doing this, right? You know? Who am I to judge what, how people were their hearts at? Although, when, you know, I found at times people come to the communion, they're so nonchalant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. They'll come. They'll come late for mass. Oh, I had one. <laughs> I had one. It was a daily mass. She came in late, finishing giving communion, and then she's running up. <laughs> so I just turned around. <laughs> she was like, "I said, go to the next." So we have two masses back to back. So I said, "Go to the next mass." But anyway. But do you see what I mean? Where was? Where's their heart at? You know, you have to participate before you receive. You don't, you don't go straight for the dessert, although I love I'm looking at it. You, know? you don't go straight without having the meal, you know? So reverence is uh, very key. So thank you for that and for the reverence. And you know, it's a, Father Groeschel, Benedict Groeschel, you know, remember her? Him? He, he had said, I think, in one EWTN thing or on his show, 
He says, if people are being irreverent in church, and maybe this is him being, you know, an elderly man, he says, if you see people talking in church, you tell them to shut up. <laughs> so anyway, so we have one guy in my parish that does. I was like, oh, I was like, oh be, be, be nice to them, you know. <laughs> but it's okay. So reverence is, is key. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, how do you um, explain in a simple way to non-Catholics that, Yes, we receive Jesus Christ in that post. I mean, if you are not Catholic, how do we do it? How? Well, simple way. Simple you know, the only the way the only way that you could do it is by witnessing that this is Jesus. I don't know. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Well, it's like, say for example, what's your name? Annie. Annie, for this moment, you're going to be my mom, okay? <laughs> yes, okay. So Annie's my mom. How do I know that's, Annie, that's your mom? That's my mom! Period. That's my mom, period! Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, she, she's beautiful, she's nice, she's, you know, she spanks me sometimes, but she's my mom, I don't know! She, she's, <laughs> yeah, but prove it. Really? <laughs> She's here. <laughs> it's my mom. But you get my point, right? I, I, we could go through all these uh, things, you know, Jesus Christ said here, this is this. We could look at the languages. We could look at, you know, what the church talked about over through the course of histories. We could do all that. But you know what? Is it all from here? It's going to be from here. And a life transform. Because remember, imagine... Imagine what Jesus Christ did when I, I read it to you at the beginning. He broke open the scriptures and he took blessed broke bread and their eyes were open. Their hearts were burning within them. So maybe there's the itinerary right there. We gotta learn what the scriptures is saying about it. You know? And then also tell them, look. I can't, as, you know, I'm not, you know, you could say, I don't have a deep theological degree. I didn't get the chance to go to a pontifical university or something. But I know this is my Lord. And I love him. I don't know how I could explain it to you, but I love him. I, you know, it's, it's, it's just, he's there. And so to end, I'm going to share with you this one last image. Last year, at the beginning of the Eucharistic Congress there in, in Cebu, that um, they had it in the Plaza Independencia, the big mass, they had a cardinal there and lots of bishops and it was very warm. Well, what they did was all the hosts, and this was a mass for thousands of people, what they did was that they didn't just carry the saboria, they carried the whole tabernacle. And they didn't have just one, but they had like a dozen. And they had the seminarians carrying the tabernacle to a truck to be taken to the, the church to be for the Eucharist to be put and stored, kept safely. <laughs> well, there was sort of chaotic after that first mass. Um, you, you all had to go to our buses and it was hot and you know lots of crowds. And I guess th this time in the Philippines is not rainy too much, but I think there was a storm that had happened uh, there before. Yeah, that's why they moved in. Was that? Yeah, that week. It, that week, there was a storm, remember? Yeah. And they said, oh, Cebu is very nice in, in January. And then when it got there, it was raining. <laughs> and it wasn't just little rain, it was like. Well, the storm had happened, and the ground became very, very muddy. Well, we're there waiting for our bus. And remember the seminary? <laughs> Someone kept yelling out, it's the Lord, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. And then the people, as Jesus was walking by, right in the mud, and the Lord was being taken. Can those people explain that? <laughs> and convince, I don't know. But they convinced me that that's the Lord by the witness of their lives. They showed me the reverence. They showed that Jesus is present. They showed me that this is the fullness of it. 
One more. What more? <laughs> yeah. So, I think that's it. I'm sorry I took up so much of your time. <laughs>